Here's to all those humble corner minstrels whose casual background music can sneak into our hearts and live there long after the grandest cuisine and the wittiest table talk. The first thing that came through my mind was why in the world would Wallace Hartley play the American version is what we call it. It's called Bethany. And I'm gonna to refer to it most of the time as Bethany from here on out. And please don't be confused with the Scott Joplin piece from that. The name of this hymn was called Bethany, Near My God to Thee. And why in the world would Wallace Hartley play that version for the very last song of his life? There's three people involved in this wonderful presentation. Of course, the first one would be Wallace Hartley. And the second one would be Harold Bride. The third would be this man, J. Marshall Bevel, Dr. J. Marshall Bevel, who is a forensic musicologist. When the captain came to Wallace Hartley and said, we've had an accident here. Is there a possibility that you could play just to keep the guests calm? He could have said no. Hartley could have said no. I mean, it wasn't, it, he wasn't employed by the, by the captain, he was self-employed. He knew what his job was, but instead he said, yes, indeed. And at that point he gathered all of the musicians together, and this was the one and only time that they played together. All the rest of the time they played in separate groups, duos, trios, quartets. This was the only time that all of the, all, all of the musicians on the Titanic played together for that one hour between midnight and 1 a.m. And what did they play? Well, Hartley, of course, would have called the tunes at that point. There was no set list for this one. And they played out of a book that I'm about to show you. I think some of you have seen my lovely little book from 1908. This is not a copy. This is the White Star Line songbook. And now it looks like it's brand new. I got it from a collector from Japan. It's nine pages long. It has 341 selections in it. And the band, of course, the band itself would have gotten the book with the tunes in it. So in every lounge, there would have been one of these little books on the tables in the restaurant. And you could look through it. You could look through it and you could pick out the selections that you wanted. And you could tell your waiter what you wanted to hear. And they would take that selection, not by name, by number. Each one of these pieces are numbered. So you would say that you wanted to hear uh, Bark Roll, and instead, the waiter would come up and say, they want to hear number 37. So what did they play? Uh, they played upbeat melodies, waltzes. Now again, just like I do every night, I kind of gauge the crowd. So they, they kept it lively and happy for that first hour, and they stayed in the first class lounge for that first hour, about one o'clock, most of the guests had moved out of the first class lounge and up onto the boat deck. And Wallace Hartley could have said, okay, we're done, but he didn't. He took them out up the grand staircase and out that first door, and they played out on the boat deck for the next hour and 16 now, minutes. I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna say it twice. He was the son of a Methodist choir master at the church in Colm. He was the son of a Methodist choir master. It's very important that you remember that. There were two wireless Marconi operators, Phillips and Bride, and they both got off, but one of them didn't make it, and the other one did. The one that lived was Harold Bride, and he'd been a ship's wireless operator for years, and was very, very good with the demanding details of his job. What was his job? To listen. He had to be able to listen exactly to what was coming through that line. So he had very, very good hearing. And he was picked up on the Carpathia. And this is such a great story. He went right from being picked up on the Carpathia, I don't know how he did it, if he crawled or hobbled or something, up onto the bridge, reported to the captain and said, of the Carpathia and said, I know you're swamped in the wireless room here on the ship. I would be more than happy to go in and help. The captain took one look at him and said, man, get down to the medical. Get your feet taken care of. His feet were totally frozen, totally frozen. And uh, he went down to medical, got his feet all wrapped up, and then he went directly to the Marconi office, to the wireless office from there, and he stayed there. This is important. 
He stayed there for the entire rest of the voyage, sending out hundreds of messages from the Carpathia to New York for them to get the information. I'm telling you this because he did not leave that office. He stayed there and he was not influenced by what the other survivors were saying. And so he wasn't listening to the gossip. He wasn't participating in the conversations. He was staying in that office, focusing on his job. Now, as soon as the Carpathia landed in New York, he was taken off. He had to be carried off, as you can see here, finally with his poor feet wrapped up. He had to be carried off, and he was taken directly into an interview with the New York Times. <laughs> He's like, can we stop and get a hamburger or something? Like that? No. They took him right into the New York Times interview. There's been a lot of stories about that. And one of the first questions he was asked, because of course the New York Times had heard about this band that had played on, that had not stopped. And so they were wondering, what was it? The question was, what was the last song that the band played? Because remember, Harold Bride caught the last boat. And here's what he said. At that point, they were playing a ragtime tune. This is 2 a.m. When I climbed up onto the officer's quarters, the roof, to assist with the efforts being focused on collapsible B. However, then the ragtime selection ended. I then heard them begin to play another song, Autumn. And you know the thing that's so wonderful is I, every single day, as fanatics do, I'm always looking for more information. And just today, I was reading an article and Wallace Hartley always finished every evening with Song of Autumn because it was such a very popular piece of music. So when Harold Bride said, yes, he was playing Autumn, now he stuck to this. He stuck to this. He said, even though hundreds and hundreds of the passengers said that the last song that was played was Near My God to Thee, he swore up and down until the day that he died that it was not that piece of music, it was Song of Autumn. Musicologist. In October of 1999, he presented this gigantic, it's really big, this gigantic body of research uh, to the American Musicology Society regarding all the songs that people said that they heard as the last songs on the Titanic. Now, he used computer analysis by taking each one of the pieces, each one of the four pieces, this is so cool, and uh, digitally structuring it and then overlaying each one. And he was able to determine how closely they matched to each other, right? Or didn't match to each other. So the pieces that he was most focused on, of course, were Song of Autumn and this Bethany version of Nearer My God to Thee that all of the guests were saying that was what they heard. So again, there were four pieces, Song of Autumn, Bethany, the English version of Nearer My God to Thee, which really, I mean, Hartley was an Englishman, so you would have thought that maybe he would have played the English version of it. It's called Horbury, by the way. And the other version of Nearer My God to Thee, which was called Propio Dio, written by none other than Arthur Sullivan of Gilbert and Sullivan. Can you believe this? So in the middle of writing all those clever little comedic ditties, he writes this beautiful hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, which we call Harold Bride was trying to get into the last lifeboat at 2.10 when he heard the band first play a ragtime song 
and, though, and then go into autumn. That song lasts about four and a half minutes with all the repeats, which would have explained why he heard them still playing it when he was swept off the deck and into the water at 2.14. Now there were roughly two minutes left when Bride was underwater. He was fighting for his life. He went off the deck, he went under Collapsible B, and he was trying to get out from underneath Collapsible B and get up on top of it. I don't really think he would have been listening to whatever music was being played at that moment. So there were two minutes where Hartley was playing another piece. Let's take another little closer look at these three versions of Near My God to Thee. The first one I'd like us to look at is the Horbury, the English version. Now really, if I had to choose between all three of these pieces, this would have been the one I would have picked. Americans and British. This was something that they would have known. They knew this song very well. Not as many people knew the English version. The Americans certainly didn't know it. So it was no surprise that this one gained so much popularity. You see, uh, there's seven versions of the movie Titanic, and not one single one of them got it right. This version, the Bethany version of it, because that was the piece that they believed that was the last song. I think you all know it. songs were not related, that people were not hearing Horbury as the last song. It didn't fit from what people were saying that they were hearing. So then, last but not least, he took the Arthur Sullivan version and he put it on top of it. I'm going to play the first line of Bethany again, and then I'm going to play the first line of this amazing Propio Dio. Here is Bethany. This Propio Dio. And it only goes on from there. I mean, I'm going to put two lines together and you can hear it. Before I do that, I want to really stress one more time that this piece of music written by Arthur Sullivan was the version that was sung in the Methodist church. In the Methodist church where Wallace Hartley grew up. That his father had taught him as a child. And that he told a friend very loud and clear that this would be the last song that he ever played if he was ever in a circumstance where he was going to die. At 2.10 a.m., Bride and Phillips send the last wireless SOS and head for the deck where Bride hears the band playing Autumn. At 2.14, the front of the ship suddenly plunges down and Bride is washed off the deck, clinging to collapsible bees or lock. At that moment, Wallace Hartley requested the last song. Now, there has been some talk. We know that John Jacob Astor was swept off at that 2.14 moment. But there's also been some talk that three of the other musicians, three of the five that we think went up on deck, three of those musicians were also swept off at 2.14. So what we do know for sure is that it was Hartley and the cello player. And the cello player just happened to also be Methodist. So there was no reason to have any music in front of him. 
In fact, we don't even know if he called it. We think he just started to play it. He had gone through his entire time taking care of the needs of others. But at this point, the last couple of minutes of his life, he decided to play something that meant something to him. And it was something that he'd grown up with his whole life, which was the Methodist version of Near My God to Be. He had two minutes. The piece runs about 45 seconds long. The ship went down. At 2.16, the funnel collapsed. And that was pretty much the end of their playing. They got in two versions of it between 2.14 and 2.16. We think they got in it two times. And then they put their instruments down and they moved to the back of the ship. The ship went down four minutes later. Thank you. 